Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let me give you a preview of what's coming up in this episode. Our hosts are Gray Cook and Lee Burton. Both are pioneers in the movement industry and co-founders of FMS. From working with high-performance athletes to training thousands of healthcare and fitness professionals worldwide, they bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the show. On today's episode, Gray and Lee talk about their professional journey and give us a brief history on how the FMS actually came to be. We discuss how we define good and bad movement and some of the factors that guide our movement philosophy. We break down how babies learn to move and how we as adults can apply it to our own lives. We talk sports medicine, athletic training, the benefits of a natural approach to movement, injury prevention, and even the Tiger King. There's a lot to unpack in this episode and the guys get a little deep. So feel free to check out the show notes for any details that you may have missed. So let's begin today's episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. Hey, Lee Burton here. Really excited about this podcast. We're going to be talking about something that, Gray, you and I both are real passionate about, and that's movement. So why are we doing this, Gray? We got a perspective a while back that we needed to come at movement a different way. We both had backgrounds that said we were supposed to be experts in, in recognizing movement problems and fixing them on the fly. And when we really tried to ask that question a few different ways, I think we both realized that maybe our our schooling was finished, but our education was incomplete. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't realize we have a long history uh, together. You know, we pretty much grew up together. And then, you know, as we both went our separate ways and we left our, you know, metropolis of Chatham, Virginia. <laughs> uh, well, actually, no, you were in the town. You were in Chatham. I was actually in Dry Fork, uh, just down the road from Wet Spoon. And that's where I grew up. But we grew up, we both grew up on a farm, same area, and we both went different ways. And then, of course, I got kind of sucked back into uh, moving back here um, after talking to you. I, I left home as well, came back around as a physical therapist and had pulled enough hours to, to get a situation where I was a director of a, of a clinic. And uh, at that time, as a physical therapist, I couldn't see athletes directly without a physician referral because I never set for my athletic trainer's exam. I hadn't completed my hours when I got into Miami and just jumped over there and went to PT school. So you quit. So, so I quit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I became disinterested. Couldn't suck, couldn't suck it up. Yeah. <laughs> no, heck no. Um, a lot of hours back then. Yeah, gosh, I was like, I, all right, I've taped enough ankles. But anyway, I needed an athletic trainer and a quick conversation conversation with your dad. It's like, hey, Lee's an athletic trainer. Why don't you try to get him back here? And I'm like, well, I'll try. And uh, you can take it away from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, my dad knew it. He wanted me to get off his, his payroll. So he was hoping anybody would hire me at that point. But I know I, I never I never really thought I would move back once I left. And I think a lot of people can appreciate that who are from small towns um, and then they leave and they see that, wow, there's a big world out there. So I really wasn't interested in coming back. But of course, you know, spoke to you. Um, but what what the one thing's interesting and, and I, you know, I've even told I tell the story a lot because I think it's something that a lot of young professionals should look at is when you're looking to get hired for your first job. Obviously, you're going in and they're interviewing you, but you have to interview them. You have to make sure it's going to be a good fit. And, you know, me coming out of graduate school, of course, like any good graduate student, I thought I knew everything. And um, going back and, and talking to you and, and actually calling up your previous employer and your previous employer told me, um, just go work with you. You know, think a little different. It's gonna be a little crazy to start. Just the, you know, just how how you operated and, and what you did. Not a bad way. Um, so I took the chance. Um, again, knew the area. You know, I could probably live home with my parents, save a little money. <laughs> um, but I, I I took the chance, and you know, it, it's worked out. And not so much, I think, because of the rapport that we have, just as much as uh, as what you were what you were doing at the time and, and how you're ready to teach me. And I think we both had aspirations to do a little bit more. I think there was a probably part in your athletic training development and part of my physical therapy where I thought, you know, epidemiology exists in every other thing that affects our physical body and health. And yet 
everybody's just sort of debating stuff. We don't debate diabetes anymore. We know exactly who's headed for it and exactly who's not. And, and we debate the ACL and we, we try to fix it from the wrong end. And I think we saw that a lot of times the, the tail was wagging the dog here. The, a lot of the things people were publishing on weren't making it to the sideline. They weren't making it to my treatment table. And I just didn't really, I felt like we could have better outcomes and I didn't even know where to look, but I wasn't really, I was restless and I knew that the bigger markets I got to, it was just more of the same. So I think in the small market we were at, uh, we sort of gave ourselves permission to try on anything because what happens if we fall? Nobody's going to see us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, you had your own little Petri dish of uh, what you had to do. But, the, you know, when we started or when I started, you know, just coming in and, and looking at how you were looking at things differently. I think the one thing that intrigued me from, from really day one is you started talking to me about getting my strength and conditioning certification. And it wasn't so much that I could be a strength coach. It was so I could appreciate exercise. And as the background in athletic training in sports medicine, it's very reactionary. And we don't like to talk about that in, the, in that world, but it, literally my job is to stand on the sidelines and wait for somebody to get hurt. I wasn't in the other side of it to try to prevent or get them ready to go play. And I think that's the one thing that really intrigued me to start was it was just as much about let's do some conditioning, strengthening, so these patients in this clinic don't always come back to see us. No, and I, I said, I think we had that rule for almost everybody in the clinic, whether it was a, a PTA with a BS degree, anybody who could sit the CSCS exam, I wanted them to, and I had done it the exact same. I was studying for CSCS and my PT license almost the exact same time and realizing I need to know what's on the other side of my discharge. I need to know if, if this person is just wants to play or is ready to play. And, and I saw the same thing. In, in rehabilitation, we were missing some things. And in strength conditioning, we were overlooking some things. And so we weren't identifying problems early and we were compounding them with workouts. Well, in, in the medical model, um, if you just think about health and the, the typical things that are ailing us right now, these chronic diseases like cardiovascular problems, you know, you've got diabetes, you mentioned, you know, we, th those are in our, we know about those. Everybody in the world knows what they knows about those ailments. And to be honest, Greg, most people know how to avoid them and prevent them. If you just exercise and you eat right and you don't smoke, you're probably going to be okay. And I think we've got to take that same mentality and, and look at musculoskeletal health. And if we want to call it injury prevention or feeling better, whatever that is, we got to take that same approach. And, and secondly, please do not think that we are academically prepared to confront the movement problems we're going to see right now. The writing was on the wall as far back as 1954 in the Krauss-Weber test when we looked at our kids compared to kids across the Atlantic at the same developmental age having huge limitations in their core strength and flexibility. And if anybody was more malnourished, it was war-torn Europe, not the U.S. that was creating a food pyramid that was probably inverted the wrong way. But yet, long before our kids were sedentary and obese by any standards compared to today, they were already moving differently than kids that weren't in this environment. And I don't know what it is about the Western uh, diseases, cancer and heart disease and diabetes and obesity and stuff like that, but there's something about the Western movement that actually occurred first. So our kids were already demonstrating motor and physical representations of dysfunction before they had bad form. Got yeah, when you, when you talk about motor and physical dysfunction, what you're really talking about is just general movement. You can't touch your toes when you're eight. Yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, like, that, that, that's right. I yeah, mean, I'm and, not and talking deep, sets and reps exactly. or push-ups here. That, I'm not talking about the, President's Council for Physical Fitness. And, you're talking about activity. You're talking about just doing things that, and again, this didn't happen last week. This has been going on for quite some time, and we've tried to fix it, quote unquote, fix it by throwing stuff against the wall by, yeah, just like you said, we're going to exercise, we're going to do sets and reps, we're going to go out here and play, you know, baseball year round. And those aren't the way to really look at movement, much less try to fix it. You and I recognize the behavior that we have been trained to do which is exactly what you said, very reactionary. When we see somebody with shoulder pain and identify a weak rotator cuff, we automatically start prophylactically strengthening the rotator cuff, thinking that's an insurance policy. The first question is, why did it get weak in the first place? And of course, it's the weakest link in the kinetic chain of throwing, but what's so bad in your throwing that makes the weakest link break all the time? 
That's the question you should be asking. And what you'll probably find is a contralateral ankle mobility problem that nobody's talking about because it doesn't hurt. And that's what I'm saying. Instead of trying to backward think every injury, why not just run somebody through a state of readiness check for musculoskeletal instead of metabolic or cognition or breathing or something else? It's a state of readiness. Well, it's, it's no different than, you know, most most individuals who are going to go in some type of higher level activity. And let's just take the one that most of us can relate to, and that's playing a sport when you're younger. You're going to go get a physical done before you start the sports season just to simply to make sure you are healthy. Now, what does that physical consist of? Height, weight, blood pressure, the basics. Basically, can you walk and chew gum? And if you can, then they're going to give you the check and say you're ready to go play a sport. And I think that's what a lot of people assume is making sure you're healthy. Well, that's only one part of it. Right. So if you can walk and chew gum, you can wear a mouthpiece, wear a mouthpiece and cleats is what, what I'm hearing. And, and, and that used to probably be true. But about 1954, we started having people that looked the same as people a decade before, but they did not move the same. And so many coaches, many exercise enthusiasts, many PTs weren't ready for a population that couldn't deep squat anymore. The deep squat was actually one of the shooting positions that we taught people to get into prior to World War II. And after World War II and toward Korea and Vietnam, we quit showing them, not because it wasn't a very functional and alternative position to get low and still fire with consistency. We had guys that couldn't do it anymore. But instead of just saying, all right, delete the problem, we could have put guys on a hill, facing down, heels high, toes low, and then reduce the hill, and we could have got most people there in 80-20, probably in about two weeks. And yeah, their groin would have gotten stretched out, and some of them would have lengthened their quads out a little bit. Thank you for complaining, but we just gave you an authentic movement back, and it's not that hard to get. It doesn't need to have special correctives. All you do is scale the activity and keep behaving the way you can, and your body will figure out, oh, I can't give that up. Right, well, we try to outsmart ourselves. We said, okay, if you can't do this, let's figure out some type of, whether it's technology, equipment. Again, industrialized nations, that's what we do. We try to make everything easier. But sometimes, as the human body is concerned, you have to stress the body. But you have to stress it in the right way so it will adapt. And when I say stress the body, people assume, well, I just got to go run until I puke. No, you just have to stress the body and really monitor that stress and make sure you're not overdoing it. Move well means you've adjusted your neurological system to the situation, and move often means now your tissues will adapt positively in that direction. If you try often before you meet the minimum of well, you will process and create tissue around a bad situation. And all well means is quality. And that's what it's too many, too often we just forget that because that's our mentality, you know, as, as Westerners or whatever you want to call it, is, you know, more, more, more. Well, let's make sure we're taking the right stuff in before we add more. Well, see, the funny thing is you suggested a qualitative baseline. Well, we have that for cardiovascular measures. We have that for body comp. We have it for an eye chart. So when we try to introduce in the movement screen a qualitative measure for movement, people start asking questions that they're trained to ask, like, well, how many sets? How many reps? How long did you hold the plank? Because they're thinking in their fitness mind, which is a capacity, that's a quantitative aspect of physical life, not a qualitative. So we can't evaluate quality because none of us will ever agree on it. A, quanti a qualitative scale says this is the minimum acceptable level because from that we come up with a vital sign everywhere else. But there is no vital sign for movement. Well, right now, the, you said something that's pretty good. I mean... <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Well, <laughs> it, took, it took him five minutes for me to pull one thing out, he said very well, is the fact that right now cardiovascular problems, a lot of um, diabetes, things that we know are chronic problems in the U.S., we have a way to measure those things. And it starts with a screen, right? You don't need to go right into and do a treadmill test of, to determine your cardiovascular health. You start at a lower level. So when you say screen... How in the world are we going to take something as complicated as movement? And you said, when we say movement, we're not talking about dribbling a basketball or running down the court. We're talking about, can you touch your toes? Can you rotate? Can you squat down? Can you pick up? When touching your toes, it's still, can you pick up something off the floor? Right. That's really what you're talking about. So how in the world do we screen that? Well, what we're saying is, a lot of those movement patterns were already hardwired in, hard in you by three years old. 
So all we're saying is, do you still have access to the original operating system that got you walking, running, and climbing? And, and so when we go back in the developmental sequence and look how you learn to move the first time, it wasn't by verbal instruction and it wasn't through exercise. It was basically testing your limits of stability in the different postures that took you to standing and then looking at all the extremity movement strategies. So you're talking about when we basically, when we were babies and growing, exactly. you're talking about going back and looking to see how did we go from basically a big glob, you know, gumbo, gumby, yep. and being able to walk. Exactly. First lesson we learn, do we move our head and arms first or our feet first? And the, the thing is, our, our arms are so discoordinated and our head is so large compared to our torso, we'll bring our feet to our mouth. We can't take our mouth to our feet. What have you ever heard when you talk to old school coaches? Do you build an athlete from the legs up or the top down? So babies start, they really get those legs moving because they can use the ballast of the body and the movement of the legs against each other. And that sort of gets them rolling. And then they can pull in that head control and arm. It's different than you think. But when we're developing athletes, we love to see kids with a background in soccer and martial arts because they got some legs under them. And if all we're doing is hand-eye stuff at a developmental stage when they should really be doing running, and when I say running, I'm talking about that nice reciprocal arm action. Little toddlers don't have it. But once a kid actually gets about as fast as mom, they but start pumping those into, arms. You, you went from basic movements into what how you would define capacity. Yeah. So capacity is when you take those basic movements and just start repeating them over and over. Often. You play with them. You yep. start playing with them and getting... Change in circumstance, same pattern. Change in turf, same pattern. And then you start to realize what's tolerable on a slick surface, what's tolerable on a narrow beam. And all of a sudden, you develop this awareness. And we call it proprioception, the ability to know where your hand is when you're not looking at it and you didn't put it there, but you still know where it is. And I think we lose that if we don't bounce off the world. And we haven't been bouncing off the world in a meaningful way for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you got, you know, you're reacting to your environment. And if your environment is stuck in an, a, a cubicle, <laughs> yeah, if your environment is stuck into a cubicle, what do you expect? You can't expect 20 minutes of exercise a day to help offset the cubicle experience. So, but you've got to have that good foundation. From that foundation, you build upon it until you get to that developmental state. But you've got to put yourself in a, somewhat unpredictable environment if you want to maintain it. And a crazy cook story, and I'll, I'll be brief with it. My <laughs> well, pregnant, well, you guys will figure out, brief and great. Mm, now no. you're cutting <laughs> into my time. Then I was going to try right, to make let's it let's let you go. All right. Got uh, two teenage daughters and a pregnant wife. I, uh, my publisher starts talking to a guy named Erwan LaCour, Move Nat. You can look him up. He's all over the place and great videos of a natural form doing everything in nature. And he had these camps where we would eat paleo and we would run barefoot and we would do two-minute breath holds and we would do all kinds of different wounded people carry. Just anything you could do to survive pretty much uh, two clicks away from naked and afraid, okay? So we're all sleeping in tents. We're all doing this thing. And nothing was really gauged at exercise or flexibility, but for the first time we were doing these rolling techniques and transitioning our body. And I realized my T-spine mobility gets better because I'm playing and rolling around and my back is touching the earth instead of needing somebody's soft tissue hands to dig through my scapula. And it's like, oh, wow, just rolling around and articulating my body in different ways that are purposeful remind me that I should have these things because next time I trip and fall, a roll is a much better option than a belly flop. <laughs> it just is. But how many people in Walmart are about two steps away from a belly flop instead of a catch myself elegant roll or something like that? It's, 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 it was really empowering for me to find that my daughter going through her growth spurt the one that's almost six foot tall now, was really moving awkward. And being Gray Cook's daughter, you'd think we'd maintain that squat and ankle mobility. She was growing so fast, it was hard to stay on top of. A week doing that, she was moving better than she could with corrective exercise. And I'm the first to admit it. And that's when I started re-engaging what Erwan was doing with what we were doing. We weren't wrong. And a lot of his stuff took longer than it needed. 
But then I started thinking about it. It's probably more sustainable if it does take longer. And if that's not working fast enough for you, we got a bunch of supplements that'll speed it up. But the natural approach is it's always better to start eating right and then adding the supplements that you need than continuing your bad diet and trying to outthink it with supplements. Yeah, it's just it's going back to the fundamentals. And I think the only thing that we tapped in tapped into early was just that gauge. It's just that, you know, let's make sure the thermometer's in the right place before we try to do something else. And if you and if you're in a bad spot, no matter what you what you try to do on your own, it may not help. So I think that's the only thing we just add to that equation is just something to monitor where you are and make sure that you don't take it above that red line. We used to make an assumption that if your mobility was good and we thought your stability was good, we didn't have to check movement we could assume it would be good. And there's probably a time where we could have done that. We still look for things. We used to look for scoliosis and flat feet because we knew flat feet weren't really good for long marches in the military. So we had a few things we looked for, but for the most part, we didn't have to question function because squatting wasn't a problem and toe touching wasn't a problem and balancing for 20 seconds on one foot wasn't a problem. But now it is a problem, and if we don't have a sensitive gauge to create a bell curve and relate some risk factors and maybe some protect, correct development strategy into there, we're not going to get this thing. This thing's going to get us, and we're going to be treating preventable things, and that makes me sick sometimes. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've always, you know, mo- years and years, 20, 30, 40, 50, really talking about Krauss Weber going back 60, 100 years ago, we were active. And we stopped being active. We stopped putting ourselves in those unpredictable environments. You know, you could you could argue we weren't all active by choice either. We had to be. So so if you have to be active, you will. And if you don't, you're going to have a tendency to rest more than you need. You're also going to have a tendency to eat more salt and sugar than you need, and uh, and and try to sleep more than you need. But these are things that are implanted in you for survival. We haven't been worried about survival for a long time. We're worried about convenience. And the less we worry about that and the more we worry about, you know, did you earn your day here on earth, physically speaking? And and the minute you start thinking like that, it's not about a carbon footprint. It's like, how many people did it take to keep you propped up today? <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's how we that's how we grew. That's how we learned. Right. Is, is we were babies or humans learn by just survival. They they want to get that blanket at the end of the crib. They're gonna figure out a way to get down there. So even in that small of an environment, you're still reacting and responding in that environment, and that's a good thing. However, it could also be a bad thing if you try to do too much too fast or just try to focus in on one thing. Yep. And, and, and the one thing, think about this. We let babies do it at their own pace, and the World Health Organization recognizes that it's absolutely normal to do it within these windows, regardless of where you grow up or what culture you grow up in. There are recognizable movement milestones that are predictable regardless of how you grow up because of one significant factor – most parents at least protect the same. They don't all correct and develop the same, but most parents don't let you crawl on broken glass or at the edge of a cliff or on a boat dock or without baby gates. So most kids get to have their trips and falls in places that aren't going to injure them, but they will inform them. And so I think all parents by nature are protective during those developmental stages. Now, by the time you get to kid three or four, yeah, they'll figure it out. But most parents are at least consistently protective. However, when we start correcting and developing, it all goes away. But if all we do for our exercise clients, our athletes and our patients, what can we do to protect them? And if they got way more risk factors than they think, then we haven't done a good job with the baby gate and we're going to get what we get. So if you can't, if we're not all going to treat the same way and we're not all going to develop the same way. But if we don't all agree on what you should not be doing any more of right now, then we're going to be lost. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll go a little bit deeper for the professionals out there. For over 30 years, Functional Movement Systems has been the leader in movement health. We've developed a system that bridges the gap between fitness, performance, and healthcare professionals. Our screen and assessment tools help pros set the course for their clients and patients and gets them moving well so they can continue to move often. The functional movement screen is the foundation of our system and checks vital signs in movement competency through patterns. From youth or professional athletics to the elderly population and everyone in between, the screen is your starting point. 
The presence of pain is a vital sign we consider in our system. The Selective Functional Movement Assessment, geared toward healthcare professionals, is the diagnostic assessment for individuals experiencing pain during movement or with the screen. Once proper treatment is administered by clinicians, the patients are cleared to resume regular activity. The screen is once again at play to set the movement baseline. But what's next? When an individual displays competency in the screen, it's time to advance to another level. The Fundamental Capacity Screen, which tests for fitness, performance, and capacity. The system identifies whether individuals warrant additional rehabilitation or corrective exercise, or if they're ready for performance-based activity. Decide what course is right for you and get started on your professional journey today. So one of the things that's uh, real popular now on Netflix is Tiger King. Gray, have you checked that out? Yeah, I'm halfway through it, so don't say anything. Well, uh, I won't say anything, but, you know, looking at you in your typical dress, you could be one of those Tiger Kings. I mean, you fit the mold quite a bit. One, sleeveless, tucked in shirt. You carry a gun quite often. <laughs> Not sure what you're going to do with that We're gun. You're just going to fast forward right to cult leader. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. <laughs> no comment. Um. I like to do farm chores in the morning. I dress for that, not this, but it saves me a, another decision. So I show up at work like this, and I, I do get some fitness people that disapprove of my appearance, and um, it affects me how? <laughs> <laughs> Just not like enough this. to change. And I think with, with uh, not getting your hair cut right now, the mullet could definitely come back. So, yeah, not too far along. I think, I think that the Chatham, Virginia Tiger King. I could go there because... Kirby, the dog, we can let him get a little shaggy and I can do some type of big cat motif with him. And He fit right in. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, that works. That works. So, And what's funny is the first day I came on the job, <laughs> <laughs> knowing from the area, because you and I grew up together, so I knew, where you, I knew we were from the same area. I was like, it wasn't Tiger King back then. I'm like, this guy is going to teach me something? <laughs> Saying, hmm. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I, you know, you brought me in as being an athletic trainer and as my background and asked me to go in and evaluate an ankle from a basketball, local basketball player at a local university came in with an ankle problem. And you asked me to go in and evaluate it. And of course, me being the graduate, I was graduate student coming out. I knew in master's my background, degree in athletic training, master's yeah. degree. I'm now PhD yeah. for all you guys who want to know, Dr. Burton, um, coming at that, knowing the ankle is not going to be a problem. I was like, ah, I'll look at my chops. I'll go in here and impress Gray. Gray thinks he knows, you know, what he's talking about. I'll go in and teach I'll him show something. The King. I'll show the Tiger King <laughs> a thing or two. So I get my hand bit off. Yeah. <laughs> so I walked in, had my scissors in my back pocket and, you know, like every good ATC. Fanny pack. Yeah. No fanny pack back then. And I wore that. I put, that was in, that was in my locker. Um, so I walked in, I started evaluating his ankle and I come out and I'm, you know, typical, you know, response to an ankle injury. This is, he's got this much range of motion problems. He's got a laxity in his, you know, ligament and, you know, giving you the, the usual spiel. I even, I even went so far as checking his swelling. Cause I thought that would impress you. Got his circumferentials. Yeah. So I walk out and I start presenting that to, to gray and, Gray, you know, takes me by the shoulder and leads me back in the room, says, okay. So then, Gray, you proceed to have him touch his toes, you know, squat down, rotate. And I'm like, you know, I'm standing in the corner and said, I mean, I'm looking around going, where the hell am I? And what the hell is Gray Cook doing? What's the this kid, aerobic class <laughs> crap? I'm like, <laughs> he's got an ankle injury and he's got him rotating and touching his toes and bending backwards. Um and then we walk out of the room and this is where I was, this was what hit me. And I'm, you know, thinking, all right, this, this crazy looking guy might have something to it. And you said, you know, Lee, we obviously got to take care of his ankle, do what you got to do with his ankle, but we have to treat the person. And we got to figure out one, we got to, and this is where it hit me. We had to figure out one of two things. Is his ankle injury creating a problem somewhere else? It may be, may not be, but let's just look at it. Or is something else in the body creating his ankle injury? And I think back then, and you're, you're talking 25 years ago, maybe at mm -hmm. this point, yeah. um, thinking a little differently. And it wasn't, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to give you all the credit. I mean, your background talking about some people like Shirley Sarman, Vladimir Yanda, um, going back to, um, you know, Gary Gray, a lot of people that were looking that way. I think what you were trying to do, you know, looking back now is trying to put all those pieces in your head. When Florence Kendall was trying to map out manual muscle testing, she didn't go 
to a sick population and try to document weakness. She went to West Point documenting what is normal strength. And all I ever wanted to do with movement patterns is the exact same thing. I didn't want to rehab people and say, you know, all my athletes that blow their ACLs seem to have a uh, dominant quad and weak hamstring. Therefore, we must stretch quads and strengthen hamstrings, and then we will have an insurance policy toward an ACL. I started thinking, well, let's think about it in reverse. Let's look at the kid that plays all the way through high school and reverse engineer everything that kid can do. And it became unbelievably clear to me that a lot of the kids that were in constant problem with knee and ankle couldn't squat. And the ones who could squat, even if they had an accident, even if they had a strain or sprain, they were back jumping on boxes in a week and a half. And it started to hit me almost every year the ratio of kids that couldn't squat, couldn't touch their toes, but were still doing plyometrics, back squatting and doing things. And you and I connected on that. And I didn't have the answer, but I said, if we can ask a global question, how do you move in general? And a local question, we know your ankle's locked up. What do we answer when we loosen up the ankle and measure it to be loose and the kid still can't squat? How do we explain it when we get the kid's knee better and it doesn't hurt anymore and strength is equal to the other side and they still limp? Movement is also a behavior. And an injury can cause a change in behavior that does not automatically readjust itself just because the injury goes away. And many of those risk factors that are emerging now, like pain with movement and stiff ankles and things like that, are are stacked against you Even if you got a great coach and even if you pick a great exercise, you're not coming at it with what you're supposed to bring to the exercise, which is a at least average movement pattern. And we found out how many unbelievably talented athletes were below average in their mobility and stability, and their talent was covering the problem, but that doesn't make it sustainable or right. Well, even after all these years, we're we're still not seeing a lot of positive impact because there's a recent study about one of our colleagues, Dr. Kyle Kiesel or some of his group that looked at people coming out or getting discharged from going to physical therapy. 70% still had all these risk factors, but yet they were getting pushed out the door because I think too often, you know, we're st- too many people in our profession are taking the approach I took 25 years ago, walk into that evaluation room with that kid with the ankle and only look at his ankle and not think about all the things you just described, making sure that everything else, if the ankle gets fixed, let me make sure everything else is fixed that the ankle caused to change the behavior. You're you're right on it. And it's really easy if we think as an epidemiologist to work backward. If you are rehabbing somebody with an ACL or training somebody with an ACL and they still don't have their deep squat, they're not finished with rehab no matter what your training program or agenda or their goal is. And and you might want to counter argument and say, well, they never had a deep squat. That's not an excuse. That's not an excuse. They're going to have to drastically change their ambition for deceleration, direction, change, and power, or you're going to have to get them their squat so they can do something with it. And if you're trying to be a musician with 50% of the hearing of other musicians, you're at a disadvantage. And if you're trying to be explosive with 50% of the freedom of movement as others, you're going to be disadvantaged. Why argue around that disadvantage than face the dragon and confront it and just do it? It's going to be just just as hard for the stiff kid to get mobile as it is the skinny kid to get well muscled. So eat your slice of pie and quit bitching. Well, and I think I think as part of that, we have to take it a step further. And you know, when we when we were working together, it was always the person's already injured. And I think right. we flipped the switch and we started saying, let's let's see what we can do to have these people avoid injuries in the first place. And really it starts with trying to make sure they go into increasing their exercise activity at a better, with a better foundation. That's right. and, and that's that's where you want to look at a pattern. And I think that's where another problem is, even in exercise, we t- worry too much about a, a part or an area of the body and not just let's make sure everything moves well first and that's just like, hey, look down at your watch. Is your watch running? Okay, you've checked the first box. If it's not, first thing you're going to do is what? Maybe change the battery and not try to dissect it down and find out that a glute medius isn't firing. Right. And, and, and what I found, Lee, when you and I came into this, people would suggest an exercise. 
And if, if, if I put you on an exercise and I found myself five minutes in still over coaching you in that exercise, one of three things is occurring. You don't have the mobility to cover the move. So you are obligated reflexively to compensate. You got no choice. You got around your back in a deadlift. You don't have the hip mobility. That means I picked the wrong exercise. That's on me. Okay. Number two, you don't have the motor awareness to handle it, even though you got the flexibility to get there. Okay. And three, there's an underlying pain that we're not talking about. That's because if you find yourself introducing an exercise and still having to coach that exercise five minutes in, you were ambitious in what you picked. They're not mobility ready or they're not stability ready. And I started thinking to myself, that's the way most of these exercise gurus figure out what you should and should not be doing. Wouldn't it be better just to run a mobility stability eye chart on the front end and delete 85% of the exercises that you have no business doing based on the profile that I just took. Well, that, that's, you just, you just hit the nail on the head is when you say mobility stability, you're talking about a movement eye chart, so to speak, but really the purpose of the movement eye chart is to first figure out what exercises should I not be doing? Right. Let's Who's blind? About, <laughs> yeah. Let's figure out who needs to sit in the front of the room, who can sit in the back. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, have always done that, whether you're consulting with somebody in industry or athletics or military, your biggest problems are unaware that they're your biggest problems. These are the people at greatest risk because they actually think they have physical currency <laughs> that they can't cash. And, and, it's, and it's, it's hard to tell somebody who wants to go, who's ready to go and wants to work and has the grit that they're going to dig a hole and it's going to become their freaking, you know, funeral if they don't stop. And, and those are the people that are going to do it. So the 80-20 ratio that applied to that uh, um, group that we were talking about, the 80% that had better movement screens didn't get less injuries, but the injuries were less impactful on the total trajectory of their development cycle, where the ones who had the lowest movement screens commanded the greatest amount of resources, time and energy of the staff to get back to where they're supposed to be if they even made it. So, so many people argue that you want to try to predict the future and you can't, but you can say that the people going into this next endeavor with the greatest amount of risk factors are probably not your safe bet for getting to the other side without slowing everybody down. Yeah. And, and that, that movement I chart is simply there to make sure you've met the basics to do this next thing. Are you blind? Do you need glasses or are we going to do the next visual test with you since you at least checked out here? And if you don't have a process that clearly gives you a binary yes, no, then you're assessing, not screening. Screening questions are binary. And remember, you remember when I went to Stanford and Stu McGill and I were going? He had to say it depends a whole lot. And that's because he knew people were asking questions out of context. If you have a good strategy, every question is yes, no, and binary. And when I have to say it depends, you assumed four things, and now I'm worried that you're going to apply this, what I say universally. So I don't want to say it depends. I want to ask you four binary questions in return, and we'll get to where you need to be, but maybe not where you want to be. Good stuff, Gray. All right. Now we have Ashley in the studio to help wrap up this episode with some questions. Awesome, guys. So a question for both of you. What advice would you give to someone graduating from school who is questioning their field or even their career choice? In my opinion, your foundational education, your bachelor's degree simply gives you just that fundamentals. It doesn't really, you know, I think you've got to get out there in the real world and practically apply the information. That's why internships, finding somebody that you, you know, gravitate to, um, that help you kind of take what you learn in school and, and apply it. I think that has to be part of what you're looking for because so many people change their major so many different times. You've got to, you know, in this umbrella of what you say your, um, your area of expertise, extra science, health and fitness, you know, healthcare, whatever it is, you know, go into a different, few different settings, get with different people um, and find out where you feel the most comfortable and what you, what you like. Um, because where, where you start, even at 21, 22 years old, at 30, it may change. And that's okay. 
but try a few different things out and don't don't just feel like you're getting pigeonholed. I'll add one more thing to don't go to the internet to solve your problems. If you can't argue both sides of the issue that's got you hung up, you don't know enough about both sides of the issue, so don't make a decision. You are not obligated to make these important decisions quickly, but as a professional, you better make them right or you better not make them. For our listeners, what are some statistics or indicators that give us a better picture of a person's movement health? Probably the biggest thing right now is one, I think what's paying the biggest biggest part of our future is knowing the obesity rates and the type 2 diabetics that we have at such a young age. I think that's setting us up for what we can look look at in another 10, 15, 20 years because it's starting at such a young age. I think the older population, we know that that at 65, 70, the, the life quality of life is, is getting worse. Um, but I think we now we have to look at what this younger group is looking like right now. Um, and the stats are pretty, pretty bad when we do start trying to exercise um, how many people hurt themselves during exercise. And, and if I had to summarize it for everybody listening, a risk factor for moving more and causing a problem is being overweight or obese, having pain with movement, having flexibility or mobility problems, or having balance or coordination problems. Well, how many of us actually at least can check one of those boxes as having a problem there? And if you can, then you cannot consume exercise with the convenience that somebody that doesn't have those problems. If, if you don't have any of those problems, you can probably put yourself in a lot of physical situations and learn. If you have a lot of those problems, you will get injured before you get smart, physically speaking. Good stuff. When it comes to children, do you think a movement screen should be attached to their physical that can clear them to play sports? I, I think if you're talking um, before they actually ta- start sports at a certain age, I think there's a certain age limit. Um, and we've been asked this question a lot over the years about how young should you screen someone? I think if they're going to go into organized sports, um, based off, again, my opinion and my experience even if they're playing a sport when they're four or five, I don't think you need a movement screen that young. I, I really don't. I think if they're playing, that they'll take care of themselves. I think 12, 13, 14, when you start getting to that age where you're – that un, unfortunately, this day and age where you're being much more sports-specific and you're just playing that one sport year-round, which is unfortunate for right now, in my opinion, I think you can add a movement screen, a general movement screen. It does not and should not be sports specific. It's a movement screen. Um, You don't need to screen for baseball. You don't need to screen for soccer. You need to screen for movement first. Then you can check those other things. Um, But I don't think, you know, as a society or a culture, we need to be trying to attach a movement screen to these younger kids, four, five, six, seven, eight, even. We just need to be trying to get them out and active and playing. And let me add one thing. When they get to the point of sport or dance or whatever they're doing, if they're in a position for you to start telling them how to move and how to play instead of just letting them sort of do their own thing, the minute in a professional capacity, trainer, coach, therapist, rehab guy, whatever you're doing, when you're telling somebody how to move, if you don't have a full map of what they can and can't do, you might be suggesting to them something they cannot do and actually part of the problem of compensation, not the solution. So once you start telling people how to move and exactly what Lee said, once they get into the early teens, we really start trying to show them how to hold that racket, hold that club, put a little backspin on whatever, uh, cut left, cut right. We're telling people how to move. You better make sure you're not telling somebody to do something they physically can't do or don't understand. What do you hope listeners can take away from this podcast? I hope they just get a little bit more awareness about their overall, you know, lifestyle and health, um, wellness. I mean, you know, we're, you know, sports medicine, medical professionals, you know, strength conditioning professionals here. Um, but I think, I, you know, what I really hope is people become a little bit more aware about what they can do themselves um, to better their life uh, long term. And I think that gets, you know, lost sometimes when we start talking about exercise and movement as the thing. But this is much more than that. Let's just try to get on the right page so that when you're 70, 80 years old, you feel good. You can play with your grandkids. You can go out and play golf or you can hike. I think also 
personally experiencing as much of what we recommend to others as we can. If you're doing movement screens and you haven't been through one, if, if, if you're doing SFMAs and haven't been through one, if you're administering a Y balance test or any of the other tests we do, I need you on the other side of that test so you can truly appreciate what the person's going through. But you're also going to have a problem. And if you don't have a system to handle your own problem, that's a good question to start. So take the information wherever you can get it, apply it and have an experience. But if you don't reflect back on that experience, you may not be full circle developed in, in this modality. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and share it with your friends and family. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at functionalmovement.com. Until next time, be sure to move well, move often.